Welcome everyone. My name is Fred Kaiser and I'd like to welcome you again to the FA, the, the Fast Team National Resource Center, the production studios here at Sun and Fun doing an exciting week here in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have any of these little items, make sure you turn them off, okay? Because if any of them go off during the presentation, we're going to have you come up here and give us a 10-minute presentation on helicopter aerodynamics. The other thing is, in, if any time you hear something that says, Easy Victor, that means we have a problem inside the building and we need to evacuate. So what I'd like for you to do is just go ahead and exit out the same door that you came into, kind of hold out there for just a couple of minutes so that we'll be able to, uh, to make my head count, make sure everybody's taken care of. Our next presenter started flying as a student in 1968. And I'm going to sit here and read uh, some of this because it is, it is so fascinating. He retired as a state trooper, <coughs> excuse me, with 28 years of service in both fixed wing and helicopter. He did 21 years in an airborne unit, fixed wing and helicopter. ATP, single engine, multi engine, commercial, rotorcraft, powered parachutes. My gosh, the list goes on and on. He's been with the FAA since September of 2001, five years as a FISDO inspector, three years with AFS 610 on light sport aircraft, and the remainder of the FAST team as a program manager in Wichita, Kansas. And basically the presentation today is going to look at helicopter or rotorcraft accidents, uh, dealing principally with flight instructor issues, risk management strategies, risk mitigation strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, since that seems to be a, a very, very big thing going on today. And the FAST team is actively involved in that uh, with, with mitigation strategies. Uh, just real quickly, I just want to give a plug for the FAST team. Uh, if you want to know more about the FAST team, talk to folks out there in the booth area today. And if you want to be a, counsel a counselor, I'm sorry, forgive me, a, a FAST team rep or lead rep, let one of us know today. I would be more than happy to talk to you. And without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jim Lamb, the presentator for, for the next, the next, <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Talk to you this morning uh, about a project that was given to the FAA safety team, and that was the helicopter, national helicopter accident training program. We were looking at reduction of accidents uh, with a special focus on helicopter training accidents. Initially, when we looked at the program, we uh, didn't realize exactly what our problems were going to be. And so we began our uh, investigation using F, uh, the NTSB reports. And I'm trying to get rid of something on my screen, I apologize but trying to get F, uh, NTSB reports to give us an idea of exactly what was occurring uh, with the uh, accident problems because we were hearing about them, we were seeing them, but we really didn't have a good grasp on what was actually occurring. When we began looking at the NTSB accident reports, we found that we were having a, quite a few of the training accidents occurring in the different makes and models of helicopters. So we wanted to decide why they were occurring and what areas uh, we, we needed to look at. Why do we look at training accidents so closely? Well, it's because we tend to fly the way we train. And especially in helicopter uh, emergency situations, we act off of our instincts because most of the time, we don't have the ability to assess our problem and figure out what our plan is going to be. 
It has to be an immediate situation. We react instinctively, and we will react the way we have trained. When we first started the project in 2008, we were discussing the accidents as the, uh, we wanted to know what the causal factors were and we needed to know what the highest frequency of training events that were ending up in accident situations. And then our next uh, responsibility was to devise strategies that would eliminate or reduce the future training accidents. So our basis for this program was that we gathered information from 2006 and 2007 NTSB accident reports. In 2006, we saw that we had 155 total helicopter accidents. 28 of those, which was 18%, were related to training events. In 2007, the accidents increased, the total helicopter accidents, to 221 accidents that year. In that particular year, we saw a decrease of, of t down to 10.4%, but still, we had 28 training accidents. But as we pulled up our last stat, uh, statistics, we saw that in 2008, although our total helicopter accidents had reduced, we had 32 of those related directly to training events, and that raised our rate to 20.7. We could immediately see that we, we appeared to have a trend but the only way we can decide whether we indeed have a trend is if we look at a much greater picture. And so we used HAI's summary. They had an accident summary that they had compiled of NTSB reports. And that summary started with 1997 and ran through 2006. So we used our figures, adding the 2007 and 2008 to do a 10 year, excuse me, a 12 year summary. What we found was that during the very first six years of that summary, that the accidents, total helicopter accidents, were gradually increasing. Yet the training accidents were holding steady. And in all together, when we looked at all helicopter accidents, we had 1,144 accidents. So over 16% of those were directly related to training events. When we looked at the next six years, we saw a fluctuation in the number of helicopter accidents that were occurring. In 2003 through 2005 were the worst that we have seen in that 12-year area. And then they gradually reduced until we pulled up our 2008 numbers and we saw that our training accidents were increasing again. 1,144 accidents in the first six years the second six years was 1114 accidents but we went from a little over 16 percent to over 19 percent of those accidents being training related so for our total for the whole 12 years we found out that we had 2258 helicopter accidents that had occurred this is all across the US and over 17 percent of those were involved in simulated training events We wanted to look, break those down to find out what were the causal factors that were occurring during that 12-year study. And were there certain training events that had a higher frequency of uh, accidents than others? Our first report actually came from the FAA Analytical Services. And they broke down all the helicopter accidents that had occurred during the year of 2000. And their study indicated that training accidents, instructional accidents, had the highest frequency of accidents over all of the others, which was really surprising when you think that when you compare those to all helicopter accidents, and in the areas where we would expect to be most hazardous, such as aerial application or external loads, that simulated training events were actually having more accidents than the other areas. 
We started with our own 2006 study, and we broke that down into four causal factors. NTSB reports showed us that in 2006, our primary causal factor was loss of control of the aircraft. They were losing control during their training events. And the second highest causal factor was low rotor RPM. So two things were happening right now. We're seeing that they're losing control of their helicopter during the training event, and the instructors are not recognizing when the rotor RPM begins to deteriorate, they're not recognizing it in time to salvage that training event. The one that I thought would be the uh, highest would probably be LTE, loss of tail rotor effectiveness. But as you can see, that was fairly low. When we looked at the training events, it became we were became aware that in actuality, landing events were the highest frequency uh, training event that was leading to an accident. But as we were putting the numbers together, we saw that in many of the NTSB reports, they were talking about auto rotation training. And so we were curious because we had included auto rotation training into the landing events. And we were wondering how many of those landing events actually would have been an auto rotation event. And when we broke that down, we found that they were a large percentage of all the training accidents. In 2007, we increased our causal factors so we would have a better breakdown. And yet, as you can see, loss of control was still the primary cause of the accidents. The difference in 2007 over 2006 was that we had more maintenance problems. But when we looked at pilot error, we saw that again in 2007, insufficient rotor RPM was the second main cause. So just like 2006, they were losing control of their aircraft, and they weren't recognizing the deterioration of their rotor RPM in time. In 2007, we separated auto rotations from the other training events, separated them from landing. And when we did that, in 2007, auto rotations were 35% of the total accidents, total training accidents, followed by landing. And in 2007, crews was the third uh, highest, uh, highest frequency of events, auto rotation, landing, and crews. That did change in th in throughout the years. Another thing that we were seeing when we were working uh, with the NTSB reports and doing the evaluations that numerous times they were mentioning that this accident was due to uh, flight instructor error. And so 2007, we took all of the accidents in which a flight instructor was on board giving instruction to see how many of those would be considered to be flight instructor error, and we found that 50% of all the accidents NTSB indicated that the instructor was an error. When we looked at all of the uh, accidents, we looked at wire strikes, maintenance, weight and balance problems. When we looked in the entire spectrum for 2007, we found that loss of control was 18% of the time was leading to an accident, and that 13% was inadequate supervision by the CFI. We increased the flight events in, in 2008. We added pinnacle approaches because we were seeing some of those on the accident reports. And in this, uh, graph right here, you're looking at all of the accidents involving all of the helicopter accidents. And we see that the highest frequency of accidents for the overall picture are occurring during cruise flight, followed by landing. So this is, if we want to call it the real world of helicopter flight, 
when we break it down to the training events, the simulated training events, it changes in that we were right back where we were in the previous two years. That auto rotation training was still had the highest frequency of accidents, followed by landing. We wanted to then look at the picture if we have this many accidents during training, because we know that during training events you can have solo flight, you may have some of those training events are by a certificated pilot who is just practicing or doing recurrency, but for the events that had a flight instructor on board, when we put the numbers together we found that even if the flight instructor was on board, a time when we would expect that flight to be the safest, we were still finding a lot of the accidents occurring due to auto rotation training. We also wanted to find out how many of those accidents that were occurring with a flight instructor on board, how many of those NTSB considered to be flight instructor error. And in the NTSB reports in 2008, they showed that 100% of those accidents that occurred when the flight instructor were on board, they found the flight instructor in error. We've developed different documents over the years to try to help us with our training programs. We developed the practical test standards, and the practical test standards is available for every category of aircraft that leads to a certification of a pilot, including the flight instructor. And the practical test standards gives us the ability to evaluate an instructor applicant both on their knowledge and their skills. But it also establishes the minimum standards that that pilot must meet to satisfactorily complete that practical test. And we also know that the flight instructor is one of our most essential parts of aviation safety. We have to assure that our flight instructors are adequately tested and that they are indeed prepared to go out and give flight instruction to a student and keep that student safe during that training event. Just as we update the practical test standards, we also have the Rotorcraft Flying Handbook. In the Rotorcraft Flying Handbook, although there are many, many fantastic documents for training out there produced by the industry, the Flying Handbook really is the basis for all the helicopter training programs. Because the Helicopter Training Handbook is the uh, document that's going to describe and uh, evaluate the way each task in the practical test standards is going to be completed. Also, this is a document that we try to revise and currently the uh, next revision of the flying handbook is being completed because there have been changes. A, um, we have been working with AFS 630, keeping them informed on what we're finding so that they can update their books to cover the problems that we're finding in the training area. One of the places we see very few changes up to this point has been in the regulatory area. A flight instructor applicant has to hold at least a commercial or an ATP. And for a flight instructor, they have to have a minimum of 150 flight hours to be eligible to um, take the, to go after that certificate. And of course, after the required training, then they have to pass the required practical test. Now, when we do a comparison of this to, say, a um, airplane applicant who wishes, who's seeking flight instructor certificates, they also have to have a commercial pilot certificate or an ATP. But a commercial pilot certificate for an airplane requires 250 hours. So one of the things we're looking at is the fact that we have a flight instructor for a helicopter who may have a more difficult training event to teach than an airplane, but yet we're starting them out with 100 hours less flying time 
than we do the airplane applicant. Now we have uh, made some changes, such as SBAR uh, 73, which applies to Robinson R22s and R44s. And the Robinson Company was instrumental in, in, in the team effort to develop this SBAR 73, which requires additional training errors for solo flight and for flight instructors. But when we do the studies, we have the SBAR for Robinson but we're finding that accidents actually occur in all makes and models of helicopters, not just Robinson's. And so far, we haven't developed or changed anything in the requirements for the other helicopters or for the entire field of helicopter training. In our risk assessment, NTSB has indicated that the majority of the rotorcraft training accidents when a flight instructor was on board, NTSB has indicated that the majority of those accidents were the instructor's failure to intercede quickly enough. What those reports are showing us is that the instructors appear not to be, uh, or don't appear to be recognizing a problem quickly enough. They're allowing the training event whether it's low rotor RPM or whether they're losing control of the aircraft, they're allowing the event to go so far that it escalates to the point where they can't recover, and so an accident occurs. They don't appear to be recognizing that the problems are starting. Many times when we were looking at the reports, we were seeing that they were having a ro uh, split needles, uh, low rotor RPM, and the instructor wasn't recognizing it until the rotor RPM had deteriorated to the point where they couldn't regain, uh, couldn't regain the RPM and thus they ended up in an accident. The other thing that we found is that the training events, the highest frequency of training events that end up in an accident are a very narrow range and most of those involved auto rotation training. When we looked at this, we found out that this trend, and indeed there is a trend, has been occurring for at least 12 years because that's what our study showed. Our risk matrix, as we have put it together right now, indicates that a operator using helicopters has a likely prob uh, probable likelihood that one or more of their aircraft will be involved in an event that ends up in substantial damage to that aircraft or injuries or death to the occupants. So where do we do? What do we do? What's our first step to change this trend? Well, we started that in Kansas City at the National Weather Training Center in March of this year. We started with what we called an ILC, and that was an industry level committee meeting. And in this industry, we invited the manufacturers, training providers, operators, and the special use entities. We gave them the information that I've given to you, and we asked them to help us interpret the causal factors using their expert knowledge to come in and give us some insight what isn't working and what do we need to change. This was a team effort and we consider this a team and as we continue through this we need all of our industry to come in and help us with this. At this particular industry meeting we had 37 industry members came in we had 10 different agencies, 10 different agency personnel come in. And our team was, although it was hosted by the FAA safety team, we had training and maintenance providers. We invited helicopter emergency services to come in, and we had several of those. State aeronautical divisions were in because they're responsible of the, for the activities going on in their states. Insurance, law enforcement, we had some of the major helicopter groups come in, 
International Helicopter Safety Team, very, very uh, strong advocate of the safety programs that we're working with, Airborne Law Enforcement, CAMTS, and the NAACS, we're all there. And with their help, we identified some problems that we felt needed change. We talked about recurrency of training. We know that many of us are guilty of, of going out and we do our currency training twice a year for flight reviews. Spend an hour of flight training and that's all, all we get. We're going to try to change that. Our flight instructor training. With flight instructors, they can renew their flight instructor certificate with an online course but does that truly prepare them for the problems that we're finding in our accidents? We want to work with them on intervention techniques. How do we change our, our program so that they have better training and how to recognize problems before they get out of hand? And experience. As we just talked about, the requirement for an initial flight instructor certificate for a helicopter instructor is less than, a flight for, than an airplane instructor yet the requirements uh, or the training events may be more difficult in the helicopter. We want to talk about crew chain training changes and night emergency procedures, especially with our helicopter EMS people. We talked a lot about simulator training and simulators are an excellent device that we can use. However, the problem is at this time that simulators are primarily available for uh, hel larger helicopter operators using twin engine helicopters with turbine engines. Not very many uh, simulators or FTDs available for the small helicopter trainer. We were looking at training requirements, changes in the requirements for the helicopter operators and many of those changes that we're thinking about really would be something that they would take on on their own, not something that would be mandated for them. Changes in maintenance, night vision. Right now, the FAA safety team has a responsibility to address every item that came from that committee. If that item is outside of the FAA safety team's area of responsibility, we need to forward that information. If it's regulatory, we need to send it up to AFS 800. If it has to do with changes in the practical test standards or the handbooks, then we need, we need to work with AFS 630 in, in Oklahoma City. And we need to develop new training programs based on the information that we received from this committee meeting. In our 2009 plan, which started in October of uh, 2009, or excuse me, October 2008, we were given the responsibility to develop safety materials, and we would provide those to our helicopter training providers to uh, develop a risk assessment program for their own operation. A risk assessment program that would help them to identify their tasks, their training hazards and problems within their own uh, training operation that would help them eliminate any future accidents. We're working with CFI uh, workshop uh, lesson plans right now. And currently there's a national helicopter CFI workshop program that is being put on throughout the country. We're going to incorporate our C uh, CFI workshop lesson plans into that national program and we'll use the information that we've been working with, the statistics that we're working with. We're going to discuss simulators. We're going to discuss recurrency training. Inadvertent IFR uh, situations, the trainers provide uh, additional information for their students to understand what happens if they get an inadvertent IFR. And if you've ever been in that situation and you're not IFR qualified in a helicopter, it's very, very frightening. Want to talk to the instructors about their experience and their abilities. They need to understand that they may have limitations, especially in their initial years of training, that until they get practice and get experience, they may not be prepared 
to instruct uh, auto rotations to a, a touchdown. Instruction intervention. One of the problems that we're seeing accident after accident is the, that the instructors are not recognizing that a problem is occurring and they're waiting too long to do anything about it. We want the instructors to uh, be prepared to train in the use of night vision goggles and night operations because especially with the EMS operators, this is a, a primary event for them. And many of them are starting to use night vision goggles. One of the things that the committee uh, wanted to put spatial emphasis on was CFI mentoring programs. We want to encourage the more experienced flight instructors to work with the younger instructors, the less experienced instructors. Give them insight into the areas that are going to cause them problems when they're pr uh, providing training to a student. Help them to better understand those events and those problems that can quickly deteriorate and give them an understanding before it happens rather than the instructor learning on their own and maybe turning into an accident. We're also making changes to the FAAsafety.gov program. And it, it, the website is an excellent source for information uh, for all categories of aircraft, but we know in the past that the FAAsafety.gov has been primarily targeting fixed-wing pilots. But they're working on that and they're changing that so that it is available and has training programs for all categories of aircraft, helicopters, light sport. We want to make it user-friendly for the helicopter people. They don't have to go digging through all the information to find the training programs that apply to helicopters. Uh, direct links to the helicopter training programs and also to the national industry groups because these, these groups are, are constantly providing updates on problems and accident information. In 2010, we plan on doing our second industry level committee meeting. And at that point, it will be the responsibility of the FAST team to uh, talk to them about all of the agenda items that they brought up and how we've acted on those during the 2009 uh, fiscal period. And we'll also review the changes. We'll look at accident statistics in 2009. And then we're going to, as a group, as a team, reevaluate our strategies for mitigation of future accidents. Again, to discuss what works, what doesn't work, and think out of the side of the box. Because what we've been doing for the past 12 years, apparently, isn't working. It's a teamwork goal. And we're all working toward the same goal, which is accident prevention. But we can't do it as individuals. We need to do it as a team. We all need to get together, work as a team, and put our ideas together. And then, maybe we have a chance to diagnose our problem and correct it. The National Helicopter Accident Reduction Team were scattered throughout the U.S., Hawaii, Alaska. We're there to assist anybody in uh, the helicopter av uh, aviation world. We can help you, but we really need the help from the uh, industry to help us to uh, help us understand where the problems are at and how we can go about changes, making changes, excuse me. Customer service is a very important factor for the FAA safety team. And if you don't remember this website, which I can guarantee you I won't, the easy way to find uh, the website is to go to FAA.gov, not safety.gov, but FAA.gov. Click on about FAA, go to offices, and then aviation safety, which will take you to the feedback area where you can make uh, comments, ask questions, tell us what works, doesn't work. We want positive and negative information. We need your feedback. That's how we 
uh, change, how we make our changes, and how we become a better organization. I thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to entertain those at this time. If not, I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure. Good Thank job. you. Good job. Well, thank you, everyone. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Has there been any discussion? There's a lot of good points in the escort.